Hello, my name is Marshall McMunn, and I'll be giving the demo lecture for Biology 110, Insects and People uh, at Spokane Falls Community College. And the topic of this lecture um, is the question of why are insects so small? Uh, and that may seem like a somewhat trivial question to ask, um, but I think there's some really interesting physiological principles that actually underlie the constraint on insect body size that we see on Earth. Okay, so the goals of this lecture are to learn the differences between insect and vertebrate respiratory systems, and to learn how the insect respiratory system is relevant to ecology and evolution, and then hopefully we are able to apply some of those physiological concepts that we discuss uh, to a novel invasive hornet that you might have heard of. This is the Goliath beetle. It is one of the largest insects in the world. It's approximately four inches in length, about 10 centimeters, um, and it weighs as much as a fifth of a pound, or about 100 grams. It lives in Africa and feeds on the sap and fruit of trees. And so it's, a, it's an herbivorous insect. Despite how large um, this insect may seem, uh, it still fits in the palm of your hand. And compared to another large herbivore, um, it's actually quite small. And so the topic that we're exploring is why is there this huge discrepancy between the largest mammalian herbivore in the African savanna and the largest insect herbivore in the African savanna? Why is this so incredibly small compared to this large elephant? Or another way of putting that same question, why don't we see these huge towering goliath beetles roaming the African savanna, uh, being hunted by prides of lions. Why instead is there this large size discrepancy between the largest insect and the largest vertebrate? And I think we can gain an understanding of the differences between the elephant and the beetle um, by talking about how our respiratory system functions. And so, both insects and mammals are faced with the same problem. They need to deliver oxygen to their cells. Cells need oxygen because they're performing aerobic respiration. They're burning sugar, using oxygen to make ATP. They need to do that constantly um, because they need to uh, perform cellular maintenance, um, do the work of cells. And so, they perform this, same, this task of getting oxygen to their cells, um, but they have different solutions. And so as a vertebrate, when we take in air into our lungs, we are bringing oxygen into contact with red blood cells. And that oxygen is absorbed onto the red blood cells, binds to hemoglobin, and then our heart is pumping that oxygen-laden blood through our bodies. So it goes through arteries, finds its way to these capillaries, uh, which are the sites where oxygen leaves the red blood cells and it washes over these tissues that need it. And so it's absorbed into these cells, used for aerobic respiration. Um, they expel carbon dioxide, which is also absorbed by those red blood cells, um, and then pump the lungs again through veins, and then we exhale. And so this incredibly intricate system is really very good at moving oxygen through our huge bodies. We can take oxygen from our lungs and pump it through our blood um, to the tips of our fingers, to the bottoms of our feet. Um, we can get oxygen everywhere it needs to be within our very large bodies. So now, let me describe how insects accomplish the same task of getting oxygen to their cells so they can do aerobic respiration. So superficially, this seems a little like a circulatory system. 
in the sense that um, there we see these branching tubes. Um, but that's sort of where the similarities end. And so insects, first, do not breathe through their mouths. They instead have holes all along the sides of their body. And those holes are called spiracles, you can see right here. And so air goes into that spiracle and trachea and follows this system of branching tubes down to tracheoles, which are these very narrow air-filled tubes which come very close to the sites of aerobic respiration in insects. And so air, instead of blood with red blood cells, is coming near the sites of aerobic respiration. And that changes fundamentally how much, how much oxygen um, can get to these cells on the insides of insects. And so we need to talk about the the process of diffusion to understand why this is limiting for insect size. And so you're probably familiar with diffusion, but I'll just describe a quick example to remind you of your intuition. And so if I were at the front of a classroom and spray a bottle of perfume, people in the front row would almost immediately have a strong sensation of smell, and perhaps even be overwhelmed by the smell of perfume. But people in the middle row, maybe 30 or 40 seconds later, would detect a pleasant floral odor from the perfume and say, oh, that, that smells nice. And then perhaps a minute and a half beyond that, the back row might just barely faintly detect this perfume. And so I've described the two aspects of diffusion which are relevant to this discussion. One is that the closer to the source, of the gas that you're talking about, the stronger the smell. So if you're close to someone spraying a bottle of perfume, that smell is gonna be stronger. The second is the time that it takes for that gas to diffuse a certain distance. And so it takes you know, several minutes for the perfume to spread out across the room. And so that process of diffusion uh, is an intuitive one that you have experience with. You understand that um, when I spray a bottle of perfume, if you were near it, it would smell strong, and if you're far, then it would smell much more weak. The same exact process is playing out with oxygen along the length of these tubes through which insects breathe. The oxygen is at a high concentration, about 21% outside the insect's body, and the oxygen diffuses along the length of this tube. And as it diffuses along the length of that tube, it's taken out by the insect's body. And so by the time you reach the end of the, the tubes, the oxygen concentration is lower, as shown in this figure. And those cells need a certain amount of oxygen to perform aerobic respiration. And so um, they, there's a certain distance at which the cells can no longer perform aerobic respiration and that is the limiting factor that determines how insects, how big insects can be. And so the oxygen diffuses in, um, but each cell needs to be at least a certain distance to the outside of the insect. Okay, so we've covered the basic physiological principles of why insects are small. It's due to this constraint of supplying oxygen to the tissues at the very uh, center of their bodies. Uh, let's have a quick breakout discussion. Um, I will make some breakout chat rooms um, and you'll be paired with three or four of your classmates um, and you can discuss uh, what the largest insects that you have ever seen in real life um, have been and where you saw them and what they were doing. Um, and we'll come back together in about two minutes um, and we can hear from each group uh, and they'll describe sort of uh, what the most interesting large insect story that they, they were able to come up with was. Okay, so we heard from some of you on um, how large of insects that you've seen um, in the Spokane area and also in travels. Um, let's now um, step back in time and talk about this historic period 
in the earth called the Carboniferous. And so the thing that's interesting about the Carboniferous period is that there was an increase in the capacity of plants on earth to absorb carbon dioxide and produce oxygen. This increase was driven by the evolution of new kinds of plants. These vascular plants could grow huge. And in doing so, those newly evolved vascular plants produced a lot of oxygen. They were absorbing CO2, producing oxygen. And so if, if we read this graph on the left, zero years ago, which is modern day, oxygen concentration is approximately 21%. If we go back in time to 300 million years ago, into the Carboniferous, we see that the oxygen concentration is much higher, around 30, 35% oxygen. And so if we were to consider our example of insect size, if we have a higher concentration of oxygen outside the insect, we might expect that oxygen could now diffuse a little bit farther into the insect's body which could allow the evolution of larger insects. And that's exactly what we see in the fossil record. The Carboniferous period, about 300 million years ago, had gigantic insects because of this abundance of oxygen. And so there were insects that had wingspans, like this Meganura, an extinct species of dragonfly, of two feet wide. And so this giant dragonfly, was flying around in the Carboniferous, perching on horsetails, as in the picture, um, and devouring some of these other large insects um, and other large animals. And so this historic increase in oxygen concentration enabled the evolution of these really large insects. And so thankfully, uh, today, we only have to deal with a 21% concentration in insects or of, inox, of oxygen, um, and our insects are the size they are currently. That can still be quite large. Um, and now I'd like to discuss uh, Vespa mandarinia, um, which is an insect that you might know as the murder hornet or the giant Asian hornet. And so this hornet is the largest hornet in the world. And so that immediately should cue you into the fact that Oxygen is just barely getting inside this hornet. Hornets have not evolved larger um, than this. And you'll also notice that this is smaller than the beetle that we talked about earlier in the lecture. And that's because the cells inside this hornet need more oxygen than the cells inside that beetle. All that beetle does is bumble around and eat fruit and sap. And this hornet actually needs to be able to aggressively fly um, move adeptly through the air, uh, and that takes a lot of oxygen. Its muscles are working harder than the beetles. And so this is as large as hornets can get uh, in our current atmosphere, um, but it's still plenty large. So the reason this hornet has been in the news recently is that the first individuals have been found um, in the state of Washington, um, and um, there's two things that are worrisome about this hornet. One is that they do have the capacity um, to sting people, and that sting is very painful. Um, and like many stinging insects, uh, it can lead to a, an allergic reaction in humans that are sensitive. Um, and it can, uh, if the allergic reaction is unchecked, um, lead to the, the death of individuals. And approximately 100 individuals in the United States each year um, die from uh, insect stings. And so uh, this is one of the you know, largest stinging insects. And um, you know, people just generally worry about, oh no, a new aggressive stinging insect. The other thing you might've heard about these giant hornets is uh, that they feed upon honeybees. And so here's a picture of this giant Asian hornet um, going after these bees. And so the way that giant hornets kill honeybees is fairly dramatic, actually. Um, they decapitate a bee, and they take that bee, um, and they fly back to their nest and consume it. 
And so uh, that alone is, is sort of gruesome enough, um, but occasionally for unknown reasons, um, the, a group of hornets will enter what's called the slaughter phase. And they will begin indiscriminately chopping the heads off of every bee in a hive um, until they're done. And so e even if the sun sets, they fly back to their nest uh, and they resume slaughtering bees in the morning. Um, it's really quite, quite gruesome. Um, and so that, more than the stinging people, is probably why we worry about the invasion of these giant hornets in the United States. Um, because we're very dependent on the European honeybee um, to pollinate our crops. Roughly one third of crops are pollinated um, by insects, um, and a lot of that is due to the honeybee. And this is a new predator that the honeybee, the European honeybee, does not necessarily have a defense for. The Japanese honeybee, unlike the European honeybee, co-evolved with this giant hornet. And they have a fascinating defense mechanism um, to defend their, their hives from this hornet. And so um, I'll just show you a really brief video. The bees hold off until the last possible moment. And then, as if of one mind, they swarm. engulfed by hundreds of bees. But they don't sting the intruder. Instead, as revealed by thermal photography, they all begin to vibrate, gradually raising their collective temperature to 117 degrees Fahrenheit. Japanese honeybees can tolerate a temperature of 100. So the Japanese honeybees form what are called bee balls. And though inside those bee balls, they are buzzing, uh, moving their wings, creating heat because they're moving their muscles. Um, and they're also using up the oxygen and releasing carbon dioxide. And so this hornet is inside this ball of Japanese honeybees um, and it's heating up. And it's also um, living in this environment with increased carbon dioxide. And as we discussed, this is an incredibly large insect. It's limited by the amount of oxygen that it can get to its interior cells. And so if we look at some recent research, um, that it's actually been demonstrated that both the heat and the increase in carbon dioxide that these Japanese bees expose these hornets to um, leads to the hornets dying. And so this was a very clever research experiment. Um, what the researchers did was they taped two giant hornets on the end of a carbon dioxide sensor with a heat sensor on it. And they stuck that into a nest of Japanese honeybees, this bee ball, as we just observed, formed around the hornets and as uh, over the next 10 minutes they measured the increase in temperature and the increase in carbon dioxide and it reached a lethal level for the for the giant hornets and so independent from this measurement they then took hornets and exposed them to this same temperature with and without the carbon dioxide and so if the hornets reached the temperature with normal levels of carbon dioxide inside this bee ball, they were able to survive for longer than 10 minutes. But if you also expose those hornets to this increased concentration of carbon dioxide, and decreased oxygen, then the hornets suffocate to death. And so the bees are turning this giant hornet's size against it. The bees can tolerate this high temperature, and increase carbon dioxide, um, and they just keep on going. They keep buzzing, uh, ramping up the temperature in carbon dioxide until the giant hornet suffocates. And unfortunately, this defense is unique to the Japanese honeybee. The European honeybee, which is the bee that lives in the United States, 
um, and is used for a majority of our agriculture, um, does not possess this defense. And so this is perhaps the most worrisome aspect of the giant Asian hornet's invasion into the United States. Um, and I'd just like to do a PSA about this uh, murder hornet, as everyone has started calling it. Um, please don't go around killing every um, insect that you think might be a murder hornet. Um, there are, you are much more likely to encounter a native wasp or a bee and have a mistaken identity. And um, we are, as I said, dependent on our native pollinator community um, to reliably produce food. About a third of our food is produced through pollinated agriculture. Um, and so if you, if you think you might have seen one of these specific species of hornets, uh, then you should take a picture of it and contact an entomology extension specialist or even email it to me. Um, and then that specialist can come up with a, an actual control plan um, and more than likely um, tell you what species that you actually did see. Um, so a bit of a tangent, but, um, but please don't kill any native pollinators having a mistaken identity with this invasive bee. Um, the, the bee is much more, uh, is, has just, just entered the United States um, and you're very unlikely to encounter it. You're much more likely to encounter a native wasp. Okay, so just to review, uh, insects lack an effective circulatory system to distribute oxygen. They have a different strategy uh, than we do to get oxygen into their bodies. They're dependent on diffusion through these spiracles, through these openings, and oxygen can only diffuse so far into the insect, and that limits the size that we can see of insects. And finally, the invasion of this murder hornet is somewhat sensationalized in the media, um, but there are some really interesting physiological principles uh, that underlie this defense mechanism that Japanese honeybees use against it.